Welcome everyone. Um, so we're ab about to start. I just wanted to go very quickly and say thank you all so much. Uh, my name is Giannina Christman. I'm the Associate Director of Career Development at Macaulay Honors College. Really appreciate everyone joining us tonight, um, especially our panelists, um, which we're very excited to hear from, um, from Reviture, Google, and Bloomberg. Um, I did want to um, give everyone an outline of what's going to happen tonight. Um, so we'll start with a panel discussion, and then we'll lead into the breakout rooms where you'll have 15 minutes with each of the panelists. The panelists will be the ones rotating because <laughs> it's just four of you. Um, and uh, the students, you just stay put in your breakout room, and then I'll teleport right? Panelists in and out of the room at 15 minute intervals, but I will let you know um, when the time is coming up. I'd like to introduce our moderator for tonight's event, and that is Anne Huang, our senior career development intern. Um, she's been with us for about a little over a year, maybe, Anne? <laughs> a little over a year. And she's a Macaulay at Queens College student, part of the class of 2023. And go ahead and take it away. Thank you for the intro, Gia, and thank you once again to all of our panelists for being here with us. Um, like Gia had mentioned, we're going to start with a moderated Q&A and then jump into the individual breakout rooms where all of the students will be able to ask questions. But of course, if you have any questions throughout uh, the actual moderated portion, you can feel free to drop them in the chat box as well. And so without further ado, I'd like for us to all get started. Um, could each of the panelists please tell us a little bit about yourself and your role and career within the tech industry? So Matthew, would you be able to start us off, please? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, thank you all for having me. Um, my name is Matthew Pepler. I am a diversity programs manager at Bloomberg. Uh, so what I do is I go out and I work with a lot of nonprofits, really, but also schools like CUNY, but really just anybody in the tech space, mainly on the campus side. So I'm, I'm entry level hiring uh, and I try to change the ratios in tech uh, to increase the number of black, Hispanic or female uh, representation at our company, but also just at any tech company company. Um, Bloomberg Philanthropies is like really committed to changing those ratios and just having impact in the world. So a fun fact about our company, we actually donate 90% of our profits every year to charity. Uh, it goes directly to Bloomberg Philanthropies. That's where all of our hard work goes. Um, so I get to work very closely with them to go identify new partners that are also working to change uh, those ratios. And I get to help support them either financially or with resume building or mentorship and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, so my day is, is, is bridge between either out actively recruiting and trying to find, uh, you know, entry level software engineers and get them into the company or going out and just supporting uh, students in general in tech and helping them get into STEM fields and into tech in general. That's really that wonderful. Yeah. To start? yeah, that covers it. That's perfect. Um, yeah, maybe some of us might even run into you eventually when we're in campus again or in person, I should say. Um, hopefully, yeah. hopefully, yeah. And uh, Jennifer, would you be able to go next and you know tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. So my name is Jennifer Hermance, and I am actually a staging manager for Reviture. And Reviture is a tech training and placement company. So what we do is we hire people, usually people fresh out of college. Uh, we hire them in technologies that are in demand. And then in staging, we work with you on honing your technological skills, working on professionalism, soft skills, making sure you get through these interviews and you're placed with one of our clients for two years, really as a uh, foot in the door for the tech industry. Um, and my job is primarily to make sure that uh, we're addressing interview skills, we're addressing technical skills, uh, professionalism as a whole, and also working on self-marketing. That's really wonderful. And I think those skills are definitely super important, especially you know going to the tech field, you wanna focus on not just the tech, but your mannerism and professionalism. Thank you for that. And Adar, should you be able to go next? Yeah, thank you. Uh, hey, everybody. My name is Adarsh Sinha. I've been a uh, full stack software engineer at Google for the last four, four and a half years. Uh, I'm, I'm currently working on Google Ad Manager, which is our ad serving platform. So we enable 
content producers who have websites or mobile apps with content on it to monetize their websites or mobile apps with uh, advertising. So that's what I do. So if you have ad block, don't worry, I won't be offended. Totally fine. I have ad block too. Don't tell my manager. Uh, but yeah. That's wonderful. Um, don't worry, we don't have ad block on right now. Um, all right, so moving on, um, thank you all for the introductions. And uh, would all of you be able to just walk us through what a typical day at your job looks like, you know, from Bloomberg to Google to Reverture, each of your roles are actually quite different within the tech industry. And so kind of going in order, we'll start with you again, Matthew. Yeah, sure thing. So my, mine is a, di a difficult one because it changes based on the season and based on what I'm doing that day. But I would say most of the time I'm an early bird at Bloomberg. You really do set your own schedule most of the time. So I know most engineers don't start until like 10. We kind of have a joke, like don't ever try to get a hold of an engineer before nine because they will not answer you. Um, and just laughing at that one. That's very true. Um, but for me, I'm in at seven. Uh, I, that's like the only time I can find quiet time to actually get my work done. Um, so I'll do a lot of active sourcing. So I go out, I read resumes, I review applicants. Everybody that applies to Bloomberg uh, does have a pair of eyes, read over their resume and review it. Um, so I do a lot of that. We get thousands of applications. So I've got to read through those. Uh, then my mornings are usually filled with partner meetings where I'll go out and meet with either schools that I work with, programs that I work with, um, talk about what, you know, what next steps, what things we need to do, where students are struggling in our process, things like that. And then in the afternoons, I generally will um, do programs like my programs management stuff. So like right now we're going to the Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers Conference. This is the virtual conference starts next week. Um, so I'm planning that. I was responsible for, for all that this year. So that's been just an enormous amount of logistical work of coordinating engineers to go with and things like that. So that's the kind of programs management side of things. And then, yeah, hopefully throughout that, I get to make offers to students and call them and uh, negotiate compensation, do all that stuff. So if you have any questions about how to do that, let me know. Happy to talk through that with you. But that's a typical day, I guess. Thank you. That's really cool. It seems like your days are all very varied, which is, you know, it keeps things fresh. Um, Jennifer, yes. would you be able to go next and explain what your typical day looks like? Uh, so mine is a little, uh, maybe not as varied, but still chaotic. Um, because uh, I am directly responsible for so many of our programmers. Every day we start with our daily stand-up so that they can tell us what they're working on, what blockers they're running into, answer questions so I can help them. Um, sometimes their blockers are just waiting on information about an interview that they had. So the next part of my job, in, in addition to meeting with our programmers, is also to meet with the other departments, our, uh, our marketing teams our trainers, our uh, higher management to make sure that A, everybody's on the same page and B, I can be an advocate for our associates um, in regards to getting particular roles, how to best do these interviews. We also run primers in staging for upskilling, cross-skilling, refreshers, making sure that um, the technological skills of our associates meets the demand that we have from our clients. So uh, there is a lot of juggling that I end up doing throughout the day. But my number one focus is meeting with my associates and making sure that they have what they need in order to get through this and making sure that uh, our delivery teams also have what they need so that my associates can get hired. That's really wonderful. So you're kind of like the behind the scenes person making sure everything goes well. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I am the messenger pigeon that advocates for the associates. That's phenomenal. Um, all right, uh, moving on, uh, Ardarsh, would you be able to tell us, you know, what a day looks like for you at Google? Sure. Um, since I've been here for about four years now as a software engineer, you know, the longer you're at your job, you tend to take on more responsibilities naturally. So these days, my day-to-day -day kind of looks like 70 to 80% meetings and you know design planning for projects uh and by that i mean somebody from way above either leadership or the executive level or the business level comes to you and says all right we're thinking about creating this feature or this part of our product and um, this is like the high level idea we have and then we have product managers and engineers who work together to 
craft that, take that high level plan and slowly trickle it down into a low level technical engineered uh, plan. And so that's what I spend a lot of my time on these days. So a typical day is a lot of meetings for several different projects. So uh, around for engineers around my tenure, we tend to juggle around four to six different projects and each of them have their own set of working groups, which means a lot of meetings uh, with every single different working group every day. Uh, not that I'm complaining, clearly. Um, and there's just a lot of, you know, if I'm not in a meeting, there's a lot of design documenting, like just a lot of writing documentation, sending out emails, essentially communicating because typically you will be the one coordinating across different cross-functional groups. And, you know, these groups include working with other product managers, working with user interface and user experience researchers and uh, working with technical writers and on some of my more recent projects, working with legal and PR and communications leads and sales leads. So it's, it's, it's a lot more than just coding as you know many people might think uh and then yeah of course the remaining 20 to 30 percent when i do find a little bit of breathing room in my day is you know heads down coding time but that often gets interrupted by uh you know as you guessed it more meetings so uh yeah it's 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 very interesting because it provides a lot of scope for soft skill growth um you know communication being able to uh, convey your thoughts and present them to a general audience, you know, not just speaking as an engineer, but being able to take these low level technical ideas and being able to convert them back into high level ideas and into like the business ideas that you're working on. Uh, those are very important, uh, important skills to develop. And so it's, it's, it's a pretty interesting shift from when you first start, when I first started at Google, which uh, I spent a lot of my time coding like 80% coding, maybe 20% meetings, but now it's kind of like inverted. So it's an interesting uh, transition. Yeah, that's really wonderful insight. And I think it's great for students to kind of get an idea of what kind of changes as your career progresses within uh, the tech industry. And so, you know, I'm sensing meetings are pretty common for all three of you throughout your day. And kind of along those lines, you know, what made you decide to enter into the tech industry? Um, how did you get started in it? And what do you like the most about what you do besides meetings? <laughs> uh, Matthew, we'll start with you again. All right, I get to go first every time. Uh, this is, this is going to sound a little bit like me bragging. I'm not trying to make it sound like that. So sorry. Um, so I started out, actually, I, I got average grades in college. Uh, I went to Oregon State University. I didn't know what I wanted to do when I graduated. Um, and I just I threw my resume up on Career Builder. And I got reached out to by Aerotech, which is one of the largest um, recruiting firms, like a, it's an agency recruiting firm. So I started out staffing architects and construction workers and machine operators. Uh, I staffed people at like Amazon, DHL, BHDP, like there's all these big firms and stuff. Um, and I was just naturally like pretty decent at it. I'm good at talking to people. I was good at talking through, you know, interviews, things like that. Um, I did like about a million dollars in sales in a year. Um, and then Google actually reached out to me and offered me a job to come and work in Austin, Texas. Um, and that's how I got into tech is Google just was like, Hey, do you want to come do that here? And I was like, sounds a lot better than living in Covington, Kentucky and doing what I am doing right now. So jumped at that, went down there. Um, and then just really, I started recruiting, was good at that again, really focused and had a huge passion for helping and working, um, with underrepresented students, had a lot of impact there while I was at Google. And that kind of led me to getting the job here doing more programs management. Um, so that's kind of my, like my track. Um, so that's how I got into it, I guess, is accidentally. Um, like all recruiters, nobody plans on being a recruiter when you're in college or when you're a kid. Um, what do I like most about what I do specifically? Um, I would say I get to actually help people and that makes me feel like really good. That's, that's a really, um, I guess I'll tell you a story. So I got, a, I had a candidate recently uh, who was a first generation uh, American. So her her parents were from Mexico. Um, and I called, made her the offer and it was, you know, well over a hundred thousand dollars. And she started crying on the phone with me and she was like, you don't understand. Like I'm the first person in my, in my entire family to go to college. And this is literally a life changing opportunity for me and my entire family. Uh, and then I almost started crying. I was like, it's okay. Like, it's going to be good. Like you did it. And I'm trying to be excited. And she's like, I'm so excited. Uh, but having that feeling, um, 
and helping somebody like that was really something amazing. And I got to be a part of that. And I got to, you know, I coached her along the way. I helped her with her resume, helped her with the interviews. Uh, and so that I'd say is, is my favorite part of my job is getting to make an offer and changing people's lives like that. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that story with us. That's really touching. And I think it brings a lot of optimism in a, you know, more harder time right now, especially since we're still kind of within the, this pandemic. And um, yeah, that's really great. Uh, Jennifer, would you be able to go next? Absolutely. So I do not have a tech background. I do not have a computer science background. And I think a lot of people who end up in tech, they don't always have that background. Um, I have a master's in statistics. This is not computer science. It is STEM, but not programming. So when I, I graduated in December of 2019, nope, yes, 2019, right before COVID hit, right as I got good at this whole job searching about three months in, that's when lockdown happened. And in all honesty, I was living in my dad's basement. I wasn't getting any job prospects. Uh, nobody was going to take a chance on me to help me move across the United States to where I wanted to be when I had no job experience and where I wanted to go. Right. So Reviture had actually reached out to me and asked if I was interested and I kind of joined Reviture out of desperation. Um, and a lot of folks did at the time. So I joined their training program and I was trained in full stack. So uh, Java, SQL, Spring, Angular, JavaScript, all of it. And so I absolutely could go make a full stack application. But while I was going through training, uh, my trainer reached out to me and said, hey, the staging department is looking for someone and you would be a really good fit. Do you want me to put your name in? And so the fact that I had been a TA, the fact that I was a scrum master for my project, like all of that really helped prepare me for my job now, which is communication and managing people and time. Um, so, and on that note, I think my favorite part of my job is when I get those little ta-da sounds, which tells me that I got an email that somebody that I'm responsible for got selected for a client. And that means I can go notify them. We can go celebrate like they're on their way to start their career and get a much welcome pay raise. Um, so especially when it's somebody that I've invested a lot of time and energy in. That's really wonderful. And I love your honesty about how, you know, you kind of stumbled your way into it. I think that's kind of relieving for a lot of students to hear. Maybe if we have some seniors who are, you know, in the audience or one of the attendees tonight. And um, it's always great to know that you can kind of start somewhere where maybe you weren't too sure about and then end up somewhere where you'll find a passion in. Uh, Ardors, would you able would you be able to go next about, you know, how you kind of fumbled your way into the tech industry? Yeah, uh, when I was, this might be a typical story for some, uh, I guess, CS passionates, but when I was nine, uh, my cousin, who at the time was in college doing computer science as well, he had created this website or just like a web page, like a really simple web page for this super fancy email system that he was building, like think like Gmail, but like for the year 2000 or 2001 or something. Uh, and he, he, he showed it to me. And what I was blown away was not by how technically complex it was, because I was nine. I did not understand any of it. But what I was blown away by was the fact that in the background, he had like Keanu Reeves as a Matrix poster, if you've seen the movie The Matrix. And it was like the animated green lines of code streaming down the screen. And, you know, it's, it's just a simple like animated picture that's in the background. But to me, that was mind blowing and revolutionary. And I was like, whoa, how did you do that? I want. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, Jennifer, like just just like that. Um, and I, I was just like, wow, I, I want that. I, I want to make something like that. I want to have like my own web page where I can put my own like Matrix fandom pictures and just like because I'm a big, huge fan of the Matrix. Um, and so from there, uh, I basically learned I picked up HTML, just like the foundation of building a basic web page and moved on to how to like style a web page, how to make a web page interactive. And then from there, over the years, I just kind of like getting, I, I went deeper and deeper into the whole uh, technical tunnel, uh, learned how to uh, 
uh, build like little games in Flash, which I don't know if anybody remembers Flash anymore. That was a thing like a long time ago. Uh, I learned how to make more complicated or complex websites. Um, I would, a lot of the time when I was in school, uh, in high school or middle school, I would be, I would just like, we, we would be allowed to bring laptops every now and then for computer classes. And uh, I would have a laptop or a tablet and I would just be like tinkering away on like side projects because I'm really passionate about essentially building things, whether it's something with a matrix background or something a little more complex. Um, and so it's really that passion that kind of carried me through. Uh, and in my high school, so I studied at an Indian curriculum high school in, in Dubai. I'm from, I was born and raised in Dubai uh, and I'm actually in Dubai right now. So it's like uh, 2.21 AM. Uh, and wh when we're in uh, high school, we get to choose a stream similar to like a light major. So I chose computer science and uh because i was somewhat naturally good at it by then because just owing to the fact that i'd been coding away since i was nine uh and and i really enjoyed building stuff i liked making things having ideas and having the ability to technically visualize and bring them to life um so that's kind of what pushed me into this field you know when it came time to pick a college uh, or think about colleges. I was also really interested in acting at the time. I had been acting in school plays a lot throughout my life. And uh, I was trying to decide like, okay, do I wanna pursue acting or what do I wanna do? Cause I enjoyed computer science as a hobby but not necessarily as something I wanted to make my whole identity, he says as a Google engineer. But, you know, <laughs> I, I, I thought about it a lot. And in the end, I'm, maybe somewhat ashamed to admit this, I picked computer science because I thought I was naturally good at it. So maybe I would be able to coast away. And so I went to college, was a very rude awakening. I did not coast, it was very hard, uh, but I still had a great time. I was still able to realize my passion of building things. And what I, what I learned about myself in college was that I don't just like building things that I like ideating on or like thinking about, but I like building things that empower other people to do things that they may not have been able to do on their own. Like I like building tools or little helpful apps for other people that helps them do something in their daily life. So uh, that's, that's what brought me into it. And what I would say is my favorite thing about this field is kind of the the passion that a lot of people bring to this field, whether it's somebody like me who started at the age of nine because of Keanu Reeves, or whether it's somebody, you know, who went to college and did not know what they wanted to do. And they figured, okay, they could try computer science because the tech industry is, is definitely booming right now. And it's, it's a very interesting field to be in too. So they went with that. And, um, you know, it's uh, what, what I really love is being able to interact with these people and being able to help them and maybe provide some answers that I didn't have when I was on my journey. And so I, I spend a lot of time mentoring and working with students. And it's also why I'm here, because I, I really enjoy doing this. So that's probably my favorite part of this whole thing. Yeah, I just want to say, first of all, thank you so much for joining us at 2, you know, 24 a.m. now over in Dubai. That really means a lot to us. Um, thank you. And but I also love that your story has, you know, the Matrix in it. Giannina just wants to quickly write that she's a big Matrix fan as well. And maybe some of the other attendees. But um, that is really wonderful how, you know, something so small and simple like Keanu Reeves in the background of a website can actually inspire you to go so far. And so you know, creativity takes us in a lot of places. And so that's a really cool story. And kind of along the lines of how you were saying, you know, you love building things that help people. I think this pandemic has definitely been challenging for the tech industry, I'm certain. And I'm kind of curious, you know, between the three of you and your different experiences with your jobs within the tech industry, is there anything that, you know, you've learned about what the tech industry is now capable of that maybe wasn't capable of before the pandemic actually hit? Or, you know, Jennifer, I know you kind of got into it in the midst of the pandemic. Is there anything that maybe you didn't think was existent or just anything that was new or innovative that you think we've changed a lot within the past, you know, one and a half years or so because of COVID? Um, I'll keep up with us, starting with Matthew, but if any of you would like to just kind of jam in in the middle, please feel free to do so. We're a very small crowd. I, I could I could relinquish my time to Jennifer. You looked like you were about to say something. So I'm gonna give, I'll let you go first this time. Oh, I'm just very smiley. I always look like I'm about to say something. Um, but 
the only context that I really have with it is with Reviture and all of the stories that I've heard from my Reviture veterans. Um, and uh, the one of the biggest things that we do at Reviture is training and training used to be in person. You know, the trainer would go around and would be able to physically help you look at your code, et cetera. Now you have to share your screen over Zoom. I was trained remotely. So I never experienced the before times. But one thing that I have found that is really cool is because we've really mastered remote training, you know, it's unclear if we're going to go back in person or if we're going to stay remote. But one thing that we've been able to do is we've been able to expand internationally. We've been able to train people in Canada. We have batches in India right now. We actually have a cohort that just started in Poland. Um, so that is something that I find fascinating is a silver lining is that it has allowed us to expand our services internationally as well. Yeah, that's really cool. And just, I mean, like from Canada to Poland, you know, all different time zones. And so it is pretty wonderful that I know even like study abroad now have some virtual options. So that definitely is really cool. And I guess we're going to hand the mic back to Matthew. Yeah. So for me, I, uh, I was at Google actually when the pandemic started and then joined over into Bloomberg during the pandemic. So I was also, I've experienced in-person and remote training in this industry, but I would say that one thing I noticed is that the tech industry was actually really pretty well set up to be adaptable. And that's one of the things that the tech industry is the best at, I would say, is adapting to challenges because we're constantly, the name of the game is innovation, right? We're constantly trying to find new problems and then solve them. So it's kind of in our nature to look at a challenge and instead of saying, well, that looks hard, I'm never going to do that. It's like, hey, what's all the ways we can solve this? Um, so I think that we were able to adapt it at both Google and Bloomberg incredibly well. I think that a big part of that, though, is kind of what Jennifer is saying. Instead of us needing to build out or getting to then build out and become this like international force, Bloomberg was already an international company. We have an office in every every country, right? We're like one of the largest fintech company in the world. So we've got offices everywhere. I have people on my direct team that sit out of London that I have daily meetings with. And so communicating with people across an ocean was, wasn't something new for us, you know? So it's kind of like, well, we're already set up really well to have those meetings. And I know, uh, I don't know, Adar should say the same thing, I'm guessing, but you know, we meet with people in, in Mountain View, you meet with people all over the place. And that's the biggest thing when we're kind of coming back to those meetings. And then the work you do specifically, you know, all I really need is a phone and a computer to, to make, make offers. And other than that, you know, the rest I can, I can do from, from anywhere on a, on a video call. So, so I think that the larger the company it seems like the more in tech, the more adaptable it was. Um, I'll just be very interested to see how things progress, especially with kind of just working from home and what, the, what an office is going to look like in the future. That will probably be the biggest thing. Yeah, that's really cool. And I think, you know, like you had mentioned, the tech company is always taking on what we previously think is impossible until it becomes possible. And so it's wonderful how you're still able to help so many students, especially given the online situation. And um, as for Adars, I'm sure Google probably, you know, had a lot to do uh, during this time, especially given how big they are with everything that's happening. Um, was, you know, what was it like for you? Um, yeah, I think plus one to what everybody else said. Uh, the, the, the biggest thing in particular was working from home and remote work, you know, in, in, in the tech industry, remote work isn't, or working from home isn't a foreign concept. Like it wasn't a foreign concept even before the pandemic, but it was not a common concept outside of freelancing um, or outside of like hiring contractors in other countries. So uh, when the pandemic hit and obviously we were forced to work from home, what we found was that you don't actually need to be sitting at a desk for eight hours a day to be effective or efficient at your work. Um, and in, in fact, uh, I, I, I can't speak for other big tech companies because I haven't kept up with them. But for Google, for example, they've been posting after an initial dip during the pandemic, they've been posting some of their best uh, quarters and financial results uh, in, in their latest earnings. So uh, it's, it's definitely proof that we've we've adapted, as as Matthew mentioned, we've you know, tech companies are built to adapt to big changes. And I think Google's adapted pretty well. And what remains to be seen is how does this fit into the future of uh, 
the workforce at these you know big tech companies because a lot of a lot of companies look to big tech companies to kind of set the yardstick of course there are other companies doing their own thing and leading the charge in their own way but a lot of companies do look to like google facebook uh, amazon and so on as to like how are they leading the charge and managing their workforce uh, so i think i think seeing how work from home continues to evolve whether it becomes a permanent option, whether it becomes a hybrid option where you're forced to come in for a few days a week, uh, who knows, but it's something that Google is currently exploring as well for next year. And uh, I, I think that is definitely the biggest, biggest thing to come out of out of this. One, one small thing I'd like to add, maybe not a conventional thing. Uh, another, another thing that has come out from the pandemic is a lot of people reevaluating their situation, their uh, their job situation, you know, there is a term called the great resignation that's propped up, that's come up during this like whole pandemic, uh, where a lot of people have been like leaving their jobs for whatever reason, whether they want to switch to another job, a better job, or just want to, you know, take some time off due to the pandemic, you know, leading to big life decisions. And uh, I think that is a different kind of innovation for people uh, to actually take stock of their to have a chance to take stock of their own lives and decide whether uh, the job they're at is really what's best for them. Um, I, I, I've had conversations with a lot of friends at a lot of different companies who uh, who took this pandemic to realize that maybe what they're doing now isn't what they'd want to be doing if another pandemic hit and they lost another one and a half years of their lives. So uh, I know for I can speak for myself, I actually decided to switch jobs, too. And so in like next year, I'll be working at a different company. Uh, and so I, I think that's like a different kind of innovation that's kind of come out from this whole pandemic. Yeah, that's really wonderful. And um, I think that, you know, as a student too, a lot of us have also kind of gotten used to, you know, being on school fully online, not something that a lot of us would have previously thought was possible. And even going from, you know, introverts who loved it, including myself to me being kind of like, I think I'm ready for some in-person interaction, but uh, definitely a time where people reevaluated their situation. And I would love to continue on that, just kind of asking all of our panelists, you know, was there a specific time in your career so far where you've had a very challenging experience or just any kind of moment where you've learned a lot from it, or even a moment that you're most proud of with, you know, either what you've learned from that or what kind of came out of it. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to go first in particular, or if I'm going to put Matthew on the stage again and, you know, start first. All right, Matthew, I guess it's back to you. Yeah, to start I guess first. it's me. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I think, you know, the biggest challenge that I, I think or something that it's more of a realization and now it's just like my everyday challenge uh, is just how, and I'm going to be very careful about my words here. There's, there is a systemic issue with racism and gender in this country, I would say, and within tech in general, um, not just tech, but I'd say most industries. So I'm not trying to, so I'm saying, be careful with my words here. I'm not saying this is only an issue with certain companies in tech. It's an issue within, I think, like education. I think it's an issue with wealth. I think there's an issue. You get the idea. There's issues. There's a lot of things that are barring people um, from having a fair and equitable shot at getting into a lot of these companies um, and just getting a job that makes them happy, like overall. Um, and so I'd say that that was one of the things that was really eye-opening. I always kind of thought, and so I started, again, I started recruitment in the construction and architecture industry in Covington, Kentucky. Uh, so take what you know about Covington, Kentucky. It's probably, you're probably not too far off. There was some, you know, there was some race issues there. There was some some stuff, but you usually didn't have to, you kind of expected it or it was kind of like in your face a little bit more maybe because it was Kentucky and it was the South and you're like, okay, that's a little racist. But you, I kind of thought when I got to Google, this just wouldn't even be an issue. I was like, I'm moving to Austin, Texas. It's a very liberal city. Google's a very forward thinking company. I was like, yeah, this isn't going to be a thing, but it is still. And there are still a lot of things that and challenges that present themselves to anybody getting into a company like that. Things like imposter syndrome. Um, I mean, I got in there and I was like, why am I here? I got, you know, C's in college. Like, what am I doing at, at this company? I felt like an idiot. Right. Um, but everybody kind of goes through that. And there's I'm kind of rambling a little bit here. The, the big thing here is that you, you hope that things are 
maybe different than the way that they, they are in reality. And I think it's because of so many years of bad systems in this country and just kind of around the world that bars people from having a fair shot at getting into the industry. And that extends itself into tech as well. And that's a really unfortunate thing that I think needs to be challenged and combated in my way of summarizing it. Yeah, I think you did a really good job at, you know, putting everything together in a very careful manner, as you had mentioned. And uh, Jennifer, you're, you have a whole speech about imposter syndrome. Um, we definitely have time if you wanted to get into that. But, you know, especially I think here at Macaulay, a lot of my fellow peers would agree that sometimes when you are in an honors pro program, especially, there's always doubts about why you're here, you know, was somebody else supposed to be there? The list kind of goes on. But, you know, realizing that it's a whole system and you're doing your best within that system, I think it's also very comforting and helps a lot with, you know, your mental state of mind when you go about everyday life and just, you know, your job or just being a student. Um, and so, you know, Jennifer, I, I don't know if you want to go next, kind of following up on that. Uh, I'll hand the mic over to you first. Sure. Well, I will quickly summarize my little speech about imposter syndrome going off of what Matthew was saying, because you're right. This is something that really does. It has the potential to affect everybody. Like everyone that you think has their stuff put together, they are very capable of experiencing imposter syndrome because it is part of the Dunning-Kruger effect. When you hear Dunning-Kruger effect, most people think of the first part, which is people who don't have a whole lot of experience, who have a whole bunch of confidence that they really haven't earned. And that gets them into trouble. But as you go further, as you get more experience, you realize how much harder, whatever it is, you realize how much trickier it is. And that's when the doubts can start to creep in the, Ooh, I don't think I know what I'm doing. The, this is really hard. And the, wait a minute, I don't know anything. Like, clearly I don't know what's going on. I don't deserve to be here. Like, if I keep going, people are going to figure out that I don't know what's going on, that I don't know what to do. Like, I'm not going to be able to make it. These are extremely common thoughts. But honestly, the fact that you're having these thoughts at all is evidence that you have more experience than you think you do. Because you, if you don't have the experience, you wouldn't even know enough to know how tricky it is. So the key to that is self-compassion, and a little bit of persistence and grit. Uh, uh, which one? That side. Grit. Being willing to be a little bit uncomfortable and push through it um, is a huge part in combating imposter syndrome. Give yourself that evidence that you are capable of working through it because your brain's just trying to protect you from getting disappointed. Um, but just remember that like, anytime you feel like you're experiencing imposter syndrome, your manager might be too. Your professors might be, your colleagues, your coworkers, your friends, your parents, like everybody can experience imposter syndrome and it is not an indicator of your self-worth or your capabilities. Um, that went a little bit harder or longer than I meant to. Um, but that's really important. Like I have a whole graph about it that I share with my associates all the time. Uh, I am a total nerd. <laughs> It's but, okay, we love that. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the other thing that I was going to say to answer your original question, um, a significant challenge. Uh, well, I could talk about imposter syndrome, but um, the other thing is, you know how emotions are temporary. So the really strong ones that you remember are the ones that happened recently. Well, over the last two weeks, my direct manager was on vacation, so I was in charge of pretty much the entire department, and I learned so much about myself. There was a lot of personal growth. I had to not only manage all of my associates, but also extra communications, escalations, more timesheets. Um, I had to be an advocate for the entire staging team. I had to put together some of these primers pretty much on my own, and I had to relearn how to lean on my team. Um, we have a fantastic team in the staging department and in Reviture as a whole. And when you face stress, if you don't necessarily have the best stress management skills, which they are skills, you need to practice them. Um, it can be easy to shut down and try to take everything on yourself, but you have to be willing to delegate. You have to be ready to ask for help. 
Um, and that's one of the biggest things that I think people forget in any industry is that nobody can do it all on their own. Even in the tech industry where the stereotype is you're sitting in a basement in a hoodie, just cranking out code, hacker voice, I'm in. That's not how it works. The, the tech industry is a team environment and you have to remember that it's okay to ask for help. Thank you, Jennifer. That's, I think a lot of that was, you know, very deep, but I think it's, a, um, I think it's also what a lot of us need to hear, especially as college students who are going to be entering the workforce very soon while still in the middle of a pandemic. And so that's definitely something to carry through with this, both in school and once we reach, you know, full-time jobs outside of college. And last but not least, I also want to let um, Adarsh have a time to, you know, talk about your own experiences and challenges or just anything you want to talk more about, you know, imposter syndrome, if you want to take a shot at that too. Sure. Yeah, no, I, I've just been here like silently clapping under my laptop for everything that Matt and Jennifer, especially have been like saying, uh, you know, imposter syndrome just continuing on that topic is something my colleagues and I talk about a lot. It's something that as they mentioned, as uh, Jennifer and Matt mentioned, it's something that we experience uh, frequently. I would say it actually never necessarily goes away there can always be something to cause you some kind of self-doubt it can be the smallest or biggest of triggers you never know it could be a simple question that somebody asks you and then you go back to your desk and you just spend the rest of the day wondering why am i so stupid why did i not know this tiny little thing or how did i miss that um and i think what what really helps me uh and what, what is something that jennifer mentioned too is self-compassion and and kind of acknowledging your own evidence as to you know, there's there's a reason why you're here. There there's a reason you've made it so far, and you know you may continue to have doubts, but the fact that you had doubts in the past and you pushed past it, and you're here today, that means that's that's tangible evidence of your success till date. And so you succeeded in the past, you'll succeed in the future. You might have failed in the past, but what comes after failure is success. You know, and and you need and every now and then you do need to accept that critical feedback that you might give yourself, you might need to be knocked down a peg just a little bit just to understand and introspect on your own ability uh, and what you need to grow, what you need to build on in order to continue growing and continue progressing. So I think, you know, imposter syndrome is, is, is a very difficult beast. It can be a very emotional beast and a very complicated beast, but it can also be a friendly beast if you just try to open up a little bit to it and try to dig deep into it while not forgetting to care for the one person who's driving you through this yourself. So um, yeah, as, as Jennifer mentioned in chat, definitely make a list of your accomplishments. That is the key to tracking that tangible evidence. You know, in, in, at Google and like many other companies, when you have your performance review cycles, typically twice a year or more, uh, you tend to present like a list of your own accomplishments or your manager presents a list of your accomplishments. and. Uh, these might be like big accomplishments, big projects you might have launched or like big metrics you have to show success. But what I think is more important is to every week just kind of track your smaller successes or highlights of the week. And I think that that really helps me a lot. That's how I try to cope with imposter syndrome whenever it hits. I, I look back at what I've done and I dig into why I'm feeling the self-doubt. What am I missing in my own skill set or my own knowledge and then I try to work on that as best as I can. You know, sometimes it's it's not a silver bullet. It doesn't work every time, but most of the time it does. And even when it doesn't, you've still grown a little bit because you've introspected. So, uh, yeah, I think I think in this field in particular, we're very vocal and passionate about imposter syndrome. And I think I I, I really appreciate that. Uh, maybe not enough people talk about it uh, to students, and I think it's really important to talk about it to students because especially when students are applying for interviews or jobs, and, and that can be such a hard and difficult process, uh, especially when, you know, if, if you're ever on like online forums where other students might be like, for example, uh, for CS majors, there, there's like subreddits for CS majors and discord channels and, uh, you know, apps like blind and so on that uh, students are on and you you tend to see kind of I'm not sure what the best way to put this is, but like the top 1% of these applicants who are getting into like the biggest companies who are getting the best offers. And so you see that and you compare yourself to it when the average CS student actually tends to not have those types of offers or that success rate. And so that can be a really tough process to uh, 
uh, to reason about when you're looking at other people and comparing yourself to them. So I think it's important to be cognizant of that and to be honest with students about what to expect and uh, and that it's okay to feel all of the things you're going to feel on this journey. Um, yeah, yeah, imposter syndrome, very passionate about it. Uh, as just like a super, I don't want to take too much more, more time, but as a small note, I think the most challenging time I had was last year, particularly in the summer. Uh, you know, we had just gone into lockdown a little after March, and we've been working from home for a couple of months now. And as we all know, a lot of things were happening in the US, right? Uh, there was a lot of tension in the US over various systemic issues throughout the country, throughout companies. And especially when the Black Lives Matter, uh, Black Lives uh, Matters movement uh, came up. And I think that was a period of time where I was pretty depressed because I was thinking about the state of this country, uh, the state of, well, I'm not in the US right now, but the state of that country, the US, um, and especially with the president back then, I don't, sorry, I don't wanna get too political, but I was just thinking about a lot of these things and how it affected me and what was my perspective on it? What am I doing? to um, take action on my own principles. Like I might have a moral compass or I might think that there's, there are things that are right that I should be helping towards what am I doing? You know, I'm working at Google, one of the biggest tech companies in the world. What are we doing as a company? And so my, my place as an employee in such a company is what uh, made me introspect a lot. And I started thinking about what are changes that we could be making to take little notches at this whole issue from our end and so you know back in our team we actually started implementing little things uh just you know things in our technical vocabulary that may not be very 2021 appropriate uh things in our just general vocabulary and the way we approach some of our processes to be a little bit more uh inclusive uh and and cognizant of different perspectives uh and those are little things we we started trying to do and i think I think that was a very challenging period of my of my life because I, I really had to take stock of what I'm doing right now and how does it relate to the state of the world. Yeah, thank you. That was a very, I think that was also a very, you know, in-depth explanation, but also a very real and tangible one, given all the things that we've experienced, um, especially within the US, even though I know you're not technically in the US right now. And it's a lot to think about, but kind of along those lines, you know, all of you mentioned you know, skills, mindsets that you need to have to succeed in the industry, aside from kind of your typical stereotypical of being good at like coding or, you know, knowing how to do the different parts of computer science. But uh, one question, um, maybe our final question before we get into our, uh, this, our breakout rooms uh, for all of our panelists would be, you know, what advice would you give students who want to work specifically at your company and just what are some, you know, if you want to add more onto some skills or attributes that you feel have helped you the most throughout, you know, aside from what we've mentioned about, you know, self-compassion and getting yourself through it, you know, um, Adar, since you had brought up, you know, Google and how you were in a state of mind that you really reconsidered a lot of things, would you be able to start us off on some advice you'd have for anyone who may want to work at Google? I think, uh, so I, I actively interview myself. I just had an interview yesterday too uh, for Google. And so I can, I, I can offer some advice. I think there, there are two components to every, every interview uh, that you have with Google. Well, let me put it this way. There, there's a whole process before you even get to the interview. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. But once you're in the interview, I think the skills that really help you succeed is not actually your technical skills, it's your uh, your soft skills, your communication. I've, I've interviewed many candidates who've maybe not had, this might be kind of harsh, but maybe not had the best technical skills for their level or what you'd expect for their capability or their background. But what they had was really strong communication skills. And when we're evaluating uh, specifically software engineers for Google, we're thinking about, uh, can, can as an interviewer, I'm thinking, can I work with this person as a colleague? Can, can they be my colleague? Can I have a discussion with them a year from now or two years from now? That's kind of what we're trained to think about in our, in our interview training. And so uh, the communication aspect is really important. Of course, you need to have some technical skills, so it's important to hone that for the interview, but being able to communicate your thought process, your ideas, and being able to translate those ideas into the technical aspect of the interview. That's uh, that's a very important 
Uh, and I, I would say something that everybody needs to hone as much as they can. And it can be harder to hone that than simply just practicing the technical side of things. Because the technical side, it's pretty easy. Like today, what most students do is they just go to leadcode.com and they like practice a billion problems on there. And then they're set for like a lot of technical interviews. And that's that's sadly, I think that's a little sad for the state of interviews in tech, but it is what it is for a lot of these companies. Uh, and so that's easy to practice. But what's hard to practice is building your soft skills and, and honing them. And that just comes from uh, trying to do a lot of public speaking related things, uh, maybe taking writing related classes or kind of taking classes outside of your comfort zone and expanding your horizon a little bit, talking to more people and especially doing mock interviews with people who are strangers to you and who might have more experience than you because they can give you critical feedback uh, that really helps. For the, for the process behind that, you know, working on your resume, I, I see a lot of students make very, uh, very easy to correct mistakes on their on their resumes, uh, especially when they go to uh, work like resume workshops that are not intended for tech resumes, which can be slightly different from regular resumes. Um, I see them make a lot of like simple mistakes on their resumes that might not make it compatible with, for example, online resume parsers, or that might not make it. Uh, the best kind of resume for a hiring manager to like really read and understand or for a recruiter to understand how this relates to what a hiring manager might want so working on that resume and presenting the best side of yourself uh, and how you can apply the skills you mentioned you have through your resume that's that's very important and in order to talk about the application of those skills you know for a lot of students they they will not have formal work experience obviously coming when applying for internships and uh, maybe even sometimes for new grad jobs they might have they might not have had any formal work experiences so it's very important to uh, try to look for other avenues where you can show off your skills so for students a very common way of doing this is a, a hackathon taking part in hackathons in college is a great way to show uh, a lot of different skills in one go and also work on something cool um, Outside of hackathons, working on personal projects, uh, thinking of any idea you might have or cool ideas that are out there that you want to take your own spin on, there it's a great way to apply your skills, hone your skills, and show off your skills uh, through a, an interactive project that somebody else could see. So that's my advice on actually getting into the process. Yeah, thank you for that really um, you know, detailed description. And that's definitely very helpful advice for students who are interested, I'm sure regardless of what company you are applying to, but specifically if they do want to apply to Google one day. So thank you for that. And before we move on to our next panelist to answer this question, um, I wanted to welcome Chedro. Thank you for joining us. Uh, would you just yes. br briefly be able to just you know, explain uh, who you are and your you know, background and history within the tech industry and your career? Yeah, definitely. Uh, well, first, uh, hi to everybody. I'm Chedro. I'm also from Reviture here in the staking team. Um, a little bit about me. I'm originally from Peru, where I graduated as a system engineer. But then I decided to move to the to United States. Um, you know, sometimes when you're young, you think in love. You are like, oh, I can go with love everywhere. Oh, nice. There is somebody from Peru. OK. So when I moved to the United States, I went to Salt Lake City. And at that moment, Salt Lake was not the... Silicon slope that is now because that's the new term for Salt Lake City, the Silicon slopes. Uh, back then in, in 2007, it was just tech it was not good, so I had to switch my careers into banking. Uh, so I, I was with a financial industry for 12, almost 10 years, no, 12, 10 to 11 years, working in different positions. None of them were actually code, but I would be doing side projects, you know, small teams, and definitely that's when I took the decision to say bye to this wonderful company and start my career on searching and trying to come back to the tech industry. I did a bootcamp where I updated myself with Angular and the different new technologies. It was a different new world at that moment. Uh, back on my days when I was a student, we were talking about 2003, 2004, Java was the hot, you know? And then I come and I see these new things, Angular, a view, and Definite, that's when I realized that you always have to be up to speed and always willing to update yourself. And then I got the opportunity to work for Reviture. And it's been amazing because I kind of find a mix between my work experience as a manager for this financial industry, helping individuals uh, to develop, and also coding that code and definite the technology. So that's me. 
and happy to be here. Apologies for the little uh, delay on my participation, but yeah. Uh, no worries. So um, I just wanted to give you also like a quick uh, update about uh, what we're going to be doing. So we have about five minutes left before we're going to join breakout rooms. So uh, I would like to let all the attendees know, you know, if you have any specific questions later, you'll get the chance to talk to Chetro in the uh, breakout rooms. Um, but then I wanted to quickly kind of bounce back to Matthew and Jennifer to see if you guys had also had any quick advice uh, before we move on to the breakout rooms about just, you know, working at either Bloomberg or Reverture. Um, Matthew, I'll let you take it away first. Yeah, sure. So uh, Adors nailed it on the what to do to get a job <laughs> at a company. So good on him. Uh, I recommend all those things. So to be successful at a job like Bloomberg or a company like Bloomberg, uh, we have this saying of always be raising your hand. Uh, and it's like if you're in a meeting and you don't know what is going on and I've been there and you're like, I've got nothing. Raise your hand, ask questions, try to figure out what's going on, get on the same page. Like, don't be afraid to ask questions. It's okay. It's it's going to look a whole lot dumber three weeks down the road when you haven't asked any questions and then you've ruined the project, right? And then you're just like, everybody's like, why didn't you do the thing you said you were going to do? Um, and at the same time, if you're in that same meeting and you do know what's going on and somebody's raising their hand, raise your hand to answer for them, but also raise your hand and be providing solutions, right? Be providing um, your opinion on things. Be active in your own career. Uh, I see a lot of times, first year or two, people come into a company like Bloomberg uh, and they're very quiet, right? They're like, oh, I don't, I've got imposter syndrome. I don't want to speak. I don't want to talk or I don't want to look dumb or anything. But it's crucial that those, at those times, that's when you are the most active in building a network, raising your hand, getting your ideas out there, getting your questions answered. Uh, so you really, I cannot stress this enough, like power through that awkward, uncomfortable feeling and raise your hand. That'd be my advice. Thank you. And uh, Jennifer, I feel like you, you want to follow up with that. So I'm just going to let you take it away. I mean, of course I do. Um, guys, Adarsh and Matthew nailed it. And I actually find it really comforting that they phrase differently what I was going to say. So at Reviture, we really have three pillars of our culture. The first is continuous learning. Like, you're always going to learn, especially in tech. It's always going to update. There's always going to be something new that you have to be willing to go out and research and continue expanding your knowledge or else you're quickly going to become obsolete because tech keeps expanding. You have to be willing to keep learning. The second one is grit. That's being uncomfortable. Um, you have to be willing to expand your boundaries. That's not just tech, that is for success as a person within our society. It's extremely important. Be willing to be uncomfortable. Uh, Matt nailed it. He's, or, I'm sorry, do you prefer Matthew or Matt? <laughs> Either one's fine. Okay. But he nailed it. He said, you know, a lot of people are scared of looking dumb. Guys, I look dumb every single day. I promise. I put myself out there. Um, sometimes my filter slips a little bit or I'll let my nerdiness show a little bit too much. And <laughs> you have to be willing to laugh it off and you have to be willing to grow from it. Um, we are all human. We will all look dumb at some point and it's okay. And that vulnerability is what fosters connection and which also leads me to the third pillar, attitude of gratitude. Positivity breeds positivity. And if you come in and you're angry and you're frustrated, those feelings are valid. But if you are also willing to look past, look past the immediate frustration and say, but you know what, here's where I am and here's where I expect I can be going and here's the work that I've done and here are the people who have helped me. Like all of these things, um, that makes you easier to work with as a team that allows you to grow further, that... <laughs> makes you generally a happier person. Um, so be willing to learn guys and communicate and be willing to be uncomfortable and have fun with yourself. Just don't take yourselves too seriously. Yeah. Um, I love that pep talk, Jennifer, and especially, you know, positivity breeds positivity. I don't think that could have been said any better. And, you know, we're on such a high note now and I love for us to transition into our next, the next portion of our event, which is the breakout rooms. So 
Gia has already situated everyone. And just as a reminder, you'll have 15 minutes uh, with each panelist. Um, the panelists will be the ones who are moving around and Gia will be moving you. So just stay put. Uh, you'll see a little reminder at the top uh, when it's down to one minute left. So just be aware because a lot of the times panelists will be mid-sentence and get cut off. So we just want to give you guys warnings. It's a little bit hard sometimes. Um, but yeah, we're going to go through the breakout rooms. Like I said, it's 15 minutes. And then at the end, we'll reconvene back into the main room uh, before we end our event. Uh, so Gia, if you could please start moving everybody into the breakout rooms. <laughs> 